Hello, we are continuing our conversation about the beginning of the Cold War, and specifically today we are going to be talking about containing Soviet expansion. We are in the same textbook. It is available at the National Emergency Library, the National Emergency Archives. You can go online and find it. It's a newer edition of the book, but it's going to be mostly the same information. <clears throat> so, containing Soviet expansion. In the July 1947 issue of the magazine Foreign Affairs, a writer who called himself X published an article titled The Sources of Soviet Conduct. The author was really George F. Kennan, an American diplomat and a leading authority on the Soviet Union. His article presented a blueprint for the American policy that became known as containment because its goal was to keep communism contained within its existing borders. Kennan argues for containment. Kennan contended that while Stalin was determined to expand the Soviet Empire, he would not risk the security of the Soviet Union for expansion. In Kennan's view, the Soviet Union would only expand when it could do so without serious risks. Stalin would certainly not chance war with the United States, a war that might destroy his power in the Soviet Union, just to spread communism. Kennan cautioned his readers that there would be no quick, easy solution to the Soviet threat. Containment would require a full commitment of American economic, political, and military power. Here is a selection from that article. We are going to continue for a long time to find the Russians difficult to deal with. It does not mean that they should be considered as embarked upon a do-or-die program to overthrow our society by a given date. In these circumstances, it is clear that the main element of any United States policy toward the Soviet Union must be that of long-term, patient, but firm, and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. George Kennan, The Sources of Soviet Conduct. The Marshall Plan aids Europe's economies. The containment policy's first great success was in Western Europe. After World War II, people were con fronted with severe shortages of food, fuel, and medical supplies, as well as brutally cold winters. In this environment of desperate need, Secretary of State George C. Marshall unveiled a recovery plan for Europe. In a speech at Harvard University, he warned that without economic health, there can be no political stability and no assured peace. In early 1948, Congress approved the Marshall Plan. Over the next four years, the United States gave about $13 billion in grants and loans to nations in Western Europe. The program provided food to reduce famine, fuel to heat houses and factories, and money to jumpstart economic growth. Aid was also offered to the Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe, but Stalin refused to let them accept it. The Marshall Plan provided a vivid example of how U.S. aid could serve the ends of both economic and foreign policy. The aid helped countries that desperately needed assistance. The prosperity it stimulated then helped the American economy by increasing trade. Finally, the good relationships that that aid created would work against the expansion of communism. The Cold War heats up. The front lines of the Cold War were located in Germany. The zones that were controlled by France, Britain, and the United States were combined to form West Germany. West Germany was bordered on the east by the Soviet-controlled East Germany. The Allies also controlled the western part of Berlin, a city that was tucked deep inside communist East Germany. Berlin Airlift Saves West Berlin West Berlin was, as one Soviet leader later described it, a bone in our throat of the Soviet Union. Its relative prosperity and freedom stood in contrast to the bleak life of East Berliners. Stalin was determined to capture West Berlin or, other or win other concessions from the Western Allies. In June of 1948, he stopped all highway, railway, and waterway traffic from West Germany into West Berlin. Without any means of receiving aid, West Berlin would soon fall to the communists. Stalin was able to close roads, stop barges, and block railways, but he could not blockade the sky. For almost a year, the United States and Britain supplied West Berlin through a massive airlift. Food, fuel, medical supplies, clothing, toys, everything the residents of West Berlin needed was flown into the city. Even through rain and snow, goods arrived regularly. The Berlin airlift demonstrated to West Berlin 
the Soviet Union, and the rest of the world how far the United States would go to protect non-communist parts of Europe and contain communism. Cold War rivals form alliances. In May of 1949, Stalin was forced to acknowledge that his attempt to blockade Berlin had failed. The Berlin Airlift was a proud moment for Americans and Berliners and a major success for the policy of containment. One Berlin resident later recalled her feelings when the blockade was finally lifted. So this is a primary source. This is you know comments from somebody who lived through it. Sheer joy, nothing else. Nothing else. Joy and the feeling that we have done it and it works. That was so important. The West has won. I say this quite deliberately in such a crass way because you wanted to know how I felt emotionally. The West? Well, we have succeeded. And the West has won and the others have not. This is Ella Borowski during a CNN interview in 1996. The Berlin airlift demonstrated that Stalin could not be contained if Western nations were prepared to take forceful action. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, formed in 1949 and provided military alliances to counter Soviet expansion. Twelve Western European and Northern American and North American nations agreed to act together in the defense of Western Europe. Member nations agreed that an armed attack against one or more of them shall be considered an attack against all of them. The principle of mutual military assistance is called collective security. In 1955, West Germany became a member of NATO. In response, the Soviet Union and its satellite states formed a rival military alliance called the Warsaw Pact. All the communist states of Eastern Europe except Yugoslavia were members. Like members of NATO, nations of the Warsaw Pact pledged to defend one another if attacked, although members agreed on paper not to interfere in one another's international affairs, the Soviet Union continued to exert firm control over its Warsaw Pact allies. Checkpoint. How did the United States and its allies apply the containment policy in Europe? So the way that they applied containment in Europe is during the Berlin airlift when they stopped Berlin from, you know, the parts of Berlin that they controlled from falling to communism by airlifting the goods in so that Stalin's blockade couldn't work. And then they formed those collective security agreements, you know, things like NATO, where it said, if we are attacked by a communist force, we will all respond in kind. If one country is attacked, we'll all respond. All right, so that wraps it up for the beginning of the Cold War. And next time, we will be moving on to some of the conflicts. So take care and be safe.